Good morning and welcome to our webinar series, Recovery and Resiliency on Main Street. My name is Kimberly Parsons Whitaker. Connecticut Main Street Center is the expert resource for developing and sustaining vibrant downtowns that fuel our state's prosperity. Our mission is to assess, to educate, to convene, and to advocate to develop and grow our traditional downtowns, our village centers, and our urban mixed use neighborhoods. Given the impact of and the challenges caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, the theme for our programming this year is recovery and resiliency on Main Street. A bit of housekeeping as we start. Today's session will run approximately one hour. Please feel free to type your questions in the chat function as we go along. Um, we'll be monitoring the chat box and we'll have our panelists address your questions as we pause for Q&A. A recording of today's session will be available on our website, ctmainstreet.org, as are all of our workshop archives. And you'll receive a brief evaluation survey in the next day or so. We greatly appreciate your input so that we can continually improve these sessions. Um, a reminder for planners seeking CM credits, evaluations, as you know, are required for AICP CM credits. I wanna take a moment to thank our sponsors without which we would not be able to do this work. Um, we are grateful to the sponsors of our educational programs, Main Street Forums for the 21st Century, which are sponsored by Webster Bank, Avant Grid, and Farmington Bank Community Foundation. Our corporate investors are People's United Bank, Capital for Change, Windsor Federal, and M&T Bank. Connecticut Main Street Center's founding sponsors are Eversource and the State of Connecticut Department of Economic and Community Development. And our growth partners are Avant Grid and the Connecticut State Historic Preservation Office. And Connecticut Main Street Center also has important strategic partnerships, including our new partnership with the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities, for which we provide educational programs that qualify for the Certified Connecticut Municipal Official Program. And our AICP certification maintenance provider is FHI Studio. So thank you to both of those partners. And I'd like to um, express our gratitude to the Rise Up Group sponsoring today's webinar. And it is now my pleasure to introduce Matt Conway. And I'm gonna stop my screen sharing for a moment. And Matt, uh, why don't you say a few words? Yes, thank you. Uh, so I'm the uh, founder of the Rise Up Group, which runs a program in Connecticut called Connecticut Murals. Uh, and we do and uh, plan and execute public art projects throughout the state of Connecticut. Um, we work with municipalities or uh, companies, nonprofits, global companies to make public art happen uh, in, across the state. And I'd love to take a, a quick 60 seconds to share a video um, that can walk through some of the work that we're doing. CT Murals is a project started by the nonprofit The Rise Up Group in 2015 to create public art that is inclusive and accessible for anyone. We have completed over 25 mural projects throughout Greater Hartford. We've worked with 15 local artists, 20 partners, and hosted 300 plus volunteers to help paint our murals. CT Murals creates public art through donations, grants, and community goodwill. We support artists, cities, other nonprofits, companies, and local community members in making their mural projects come to life. We help create the vision and manage the entire process to beautify communities through public art. Find us at CT Murals on Instagram and Facebook, or send us a message via our website at ctmurals.com. Yeah, so that's a little bit about us, and uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to sponsor this event and hope to, to work with some of you folks on this call to make more public art happen in Connecticut. 
Thank you so much, Matt. Thanks for being here today. We know you are out in the field doing your important work. So it's just a pleasure to see you. Yeah. <laughs> um, but thank you very much for your sponsorship. Um, I've seen a number of the murals. I was in downtown Manchester last week. Um, of course, there's a bunch in downtown Hartford, uh, one that's going up in West Hartford right now and all over the place. So um, it's a great, great place making um, and really excellent work that involves community. So thank you very much, Matt. Um, I'm going to go back to this and do a quick introduction because we are ready to start our webinar program. So that was Matt. So our program today, we are really pleased about this. Um, People-focused planning, ensuring that your POCD update is inclusive and embraces your downtown renaissance. Um, as many of you know, Plan of Conservation and Development provides municipalities with opportunities to imagine a new vision for their future. Futures, uh, a vision that reflects the diverse voices of community and will ensure equitable growth and promote sustainable downtown renaissance. So I'm delighted to welcome our speakers today. Francisco Gomes is an urban planner landscape architect and senior project manager. He is New England mobility and land use manager at FHI Studio. We're also joined by Zainab Kazmi, who is a planner at FHI Studio. And our third speaker today is Todd Dume, and he is the town planner for the town of West Hartford. So many thanks to all three of you, and I will now turn it over to you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Kim. Um, today, we'll, we'll talk about people-focused planning um, from the perspective of plans of conservation and development, or POCDs. And uh, so we'll feature uh, three uh, communities that we've worked with, and uh, we'll, we'll speak with Todd about uh, the work we did there in West Hartford. And, and really from the perspective of uh, how can the POCD afford an opportunity to include the community in the planning process? And also, because this is a Connecticut Main Street Center web webinar, um, how can POCDs use to uh, energize, revitalize, reinvest in our, our town centers and main streets? Uh, and uh, to go to the next slide, I, as a reminder, I'm joined today by both Zainab and Todd. Uh, we had the pleasure of, of working with Todd a couple of years ago and updating their POCD. And, and Todd, if you're there, give us a wave so everyone can see you. And uh, Zainab, I've worked with for a few years now on, on POCDs, including Bridgeport, which we'll be talking about uh, today. And Zainab, give everyone a wave so they can see you. Thank you. All right, our, so our agenda today is uh, we're, we're gonna, first of all, we're not gonna assume that everyone knows what a POCD is all about. So we're gonna give you some basics on that. And then we'll, we'll talk about three communities, uh, West Hartford, Bridgeport, and Danbury. Um, and then we'll talk about how we can make the process of updating a plan of conservation and development inclusive. How do we, how we try to do that? Um, and, and part of that is being extremely comprehensive with our community engagement. Then we'll talk a little bit about the plan itself and how we try to make that a, a living document uh, that doesn't sit on a shelf, which I think is in any planning work that anyone does, it's always the goal. So what is uh, a POCD? Well, uh, a POCD is statutory, statutorily required by uh, Connecticut Section 823 um, and it re which requires every municipality in the state to prepare a plan at least every 10 years. But it, it's also an opportunity for communities to do some real hard thinking and, and really ex, uh, create a conversation with their community ab about where their community needs to go over the next 10 plus years. Um, this is a tremendous opportunity for any community and, and on, a, on a, every year there's a whole kind of host of communities that are out there trying to figure out this process across the state. 
Um, and, and we do a lot of work with, with those communities, whether it's small towns or, or big cities. All right, so what should the POCD do? Uh, well, it, first of all, it, it is a guiding document. It is the foundation for a lot of poly community policies, for zoning regulations, uh, for capital improvement, all sorts of investments that a community might do and it points to all the things that that needed to be done in the community uh, and in, in order for that that document to be successful it, it really needs to be inclusive it, it needs to include all include all stakeholders in the process so that their voice and concerns are heard that way there's buy-in to the recommendations of the plan whether those be the broad vision or goals or strategies. And, and we typically organize a POCD and most many communities do with a broad vision statement. And that vision statement, it is a sentence or a paragraph that basically is, is a, an idea that just about everyone can agree upon uh, about what, who their community, you know, what their community is, who it serves, and, and where it's going or where it wants to be. And the, the policies, the goals, the recommendations of the POCD should all line up with that vision. Uh, so that, that's the catch all for the plan. And, and that's something that we, we begin with early on and we try to include as many people as possible in, in shaping that vision. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about the plan components. Uh, the POCD covers a lot of ground. It's a comprehensive plan. It covers environmental aspects, open space, economic development, housing, transportation, uh, you know, zoning issues, land use, uh, maintenance in, to some degree, maintenance if, issues, particularly with respect to facilities and infrastructure, um, governance and, and how the a town goes about it or a city goes about its its business and, and uh, how it interfaces with the community. All of those things can uh, can be represented in the plan. The, the state has a pretty strict requirement of what's in there, but uh, the plan affords each community an opportunity to think comprehensively about uh, uh, how, how it does its business and, and how it wants to carry forward in the future. All right, uh, so as I mentioned, we're gonna talk about three POCDs today. And uh, that includes Bridgeport, West Hartford, and Danbury. And uh, both Bridgeport and West Hartford have been completed now for a couple of years. In Danbury, we're currently working uh, with the city and we're fairly early on in that process. So we probably have a little less to talk about there, uh, but let's, let's go ahead and jump in into it and we'll start with West Hartford. Um, and, and once again, Todd DeMay is here, town planner for West Hartford. And, and he'll be able to, to talk about, um, you know, what was really driving the impetus uh, for this plan. And, it, and, and I can tell you, it, it isn't just checking the box and meeting the state's mandate. Uh, I think West Hartford understood that this was an opportunity for them to you know, address some issues and, and do some uh, real visioning around uh, uh, areas in town such as West Hartford Center and New Park Avenue. So with that said, I, I'd like to turn it over to Todd to talk, uh, to give us a little background on, on some of the, the driving forces behind this plan and, and to talk about our process uh, that we, we went through in, in developing the plan. Todd, the Thank floor you. is yours. Thank you, Francisco, uh, and thanks to CT Main Street for organizing the event and to all the participants in attendance. I'll attempt to keep my remarks brief and, as Francisco mentioned, really focused upon West Hartford's recent experience updating our POCD with a particular eye towards inclusivity and, and kind of the support <clears throat> of the town's various commercial center districts. Um, having said that, you know, like many communities in the state, I think that West Hartford embarked on its POCD update a bit behind schedule and uh, I would contend under budgeted for the task we had uh, ahead of us. Um, ultimately, we requested a waiver from OPM for an expired POCD. I know many communities uh, are in that position. Don't feel bad if you are. Um, 
it's more important to get the plan and process correct than rush through to just meet the state uh, mandate. Our process was not without its challenges or time delays, but I do feel that the uh, adopted POCD did create a living document, as Francisco mentioned, and one that will support achieving our community's vision. By way of background, West Hartford um, is perhaps unlike many communities in the state in that it's a special act town, special act community, and it has a few unique features outlined in its charter that add additional authorities into the POC development process. Chief among them probably is the town council. Uh, while our town plan and zoning commission is defined as the town's plan of conservation development preparation authority, the town council is also the town's zoning authority and has not only the ability to approve the POCD recommended and adopted by the plan, uh, planning commission, which is consistent with state statute, but it uniquely has the power to reject all or any part of the TPZ adopted POCD and then constitute themselves as the planning authority and thus reauthor any or all of the POCD. Uh, Francisco and I joked that through our process, we you know, call this the nuclear option. You know, if we, if we didn't do our jobs correctly, our town council could have interdicted themselves in the process and, and chose to, to restart it all. Historically in the past in West Hartford, that has happened before. Uh, in distant decades. So with that in the back of our minds, we wanted to make sure that we created a very inclusive process as part of our update. Uh, additionally, the town is blessed with many active business and neighborhood groups and an extremely engaged cit citizenry. So I guess all, all that is my way of saying that we knew there would be a lot of cooks in the POC kitchen. We wanted to make sure that everyone had a, a place at the table and in, in the kitchen. So, the process was led by our, our town plan and zoning commission, and there was significant input and engagement from the town council, various boards and commissions, and, and really all of our stakeholders in the community. Um, if I could circle back a second to something that Francisco had said earlier about what a POCD should do, early on in our process, uh, staff really stressed the importance, and so did Francisco and his team at FHI, that the POCD should not only be seen as uh, meeting a state mandate, but really as a planning process that affords your community an opportunity to measure progress uh, that your community has made towards the goals of its prior plan, uh, to identify any trends or areas of concerns within the community, to importantly establish a dialogue with residents and stakeholders, and really effectively communicate the strategic work and care careful investments that a town or your community has made over the last 10 years. And then, it, then equally important is to provide that foundation and set for new initiatives going forward. Now, we approached our process uh, and driving process as an update. We weren't intending to rewrite our entire plan, which we ultimately did, which caused some of our delays. Um, and I don't think that a, a plan of conservation development update or a new vision statement for that matter needs to be a radical change or depart, departure from prior plans. You know, not many communities in the state are growing rapidly. You know, we're the land of steady habits uh, in, in Connecticut. And it, perhaps your community has uh, a well-prepared prior plan of conservation and development. It only needs to be strategically updated in certain areas uh, and, and looked at overall with a new fresh set of eyes and, and input. Within West Hartford, we went in with the assumption that that would be our process. We knew that based on uh, you know, the past 10 years of recent planning initiatives. Uh, we did some um, community engagement and strategic planning in and around our, our downtown, our West Hartford Center. We also did some planning effort around our New Park Avenue corridor. New Park Avenue is the area in town where we have two Connecticut fast track transit stations. Um, we knew that based on some of the development and activity uh, both the national and local trends that we were experiencing, um, we knew that a major focus of our plan update was going to have to be economic development. Our town council was very much interested in this being a focus of the plan. And we knew that based on all of those circumstances occurring in the community, that that needed to be a focus. So unlike many communities, I think West Hartford's blessed with not one, uh, but six vibrant commercial centers. I know many people probably think of West Hartford and they think of the center or Blueback Square, but we have many other vibrant districts such as Bishop's Corner, Corbin's Corner, Elmwood, Park Road, 
all of which have uh, characteristics and traits of traditional downtown environments. To really address this challenge, uh, FHI was able to bring on uh, additional planning uh, assistance in Larissa Ortiz, Larissa Ortiz Associates. And with them, we conducted a very comprehensive retail analysis as part of our POCD process. This process examined demographic and economic data, industry and national trends, and performed a district by district analysis of each of our commercial areas and identified strengths, challenges, and opportunities for each area. That analysis was informed by significant community outreach. Uh, I know Francisco and Zanib will talk about the outreach efforts that they do more comprehensively as part of a POCD process later on in the presentation. But we structured our outreach um, vis-a-vis online platforms, and, and you'll see some of those tools we used. We had a comprehensive community survey. We held thematic meetings with our business and neighborhood associations. Staff went to our business and neighborhood association meetings to gather additional input and feedback. We held um, comment and message boards in all of our public facilities, town hall, libraries, senior centers. We um, did some presentations at our senior centers and engaged the community. We met with our planning commission, our town council and various other boards and commissions. Also with our general public, uh, we had general public engagement. And importantly, we did targeted and focused interviews with our large employers and property owners uh, with a lens uh, on the economic development section. Ultimately, through this inclusive and targeted planning process, we established our POCD's economic development goals, strategies, and actions, all of which I believe will support future policy initiatives and serve to strengthen and foster responsible growth and change in each of our commercial centers. The slide that's, uh, that I've been talking uh, in front of, as Francisco mentioned, was, was the way we decided to structure our plan. And this was largely, I think, at FHI's guidance. I think they have a really good uh, strategy for organizing the plan and we sought to organize our POCD differently than we have in the past. Uh, very early on in the process, uh, our planning commission identified four key principles based on a lot of our input that we received through our outreach um, that became our guiding lenses. And those were meant to serve as a filter uh, for the creation of both our, our vision, goals, and strategies and actions of the plans. Uh, Francisco briefly touched upon um, you know, the broad vision statement is really the kind of sitting at the top of the POCD document. Everything else is then organized by thematic sections that essentially serve as a foundation for the town um, in areas that directly influence quality of life. Um, the vision is supported by a goal in each one of those thematic sections. And then within each goal, there are strategies and guidance on how to achieve that goal and then specific actions identified under each strategy that are tried to um, create a step-by-step -step method for implementing those strategies and achieving the goals. Next slide, please, Kimber. So the four guiding lenses that our planning commission uh, ultimately landed on were sustainability, connectivity, equity, and innovation. Uh, through each of these guiding lenses, um, really focused on the needs of the community. I'd like to take a second just to um, though it's not on the slide here, is to talk about, I think, the equity lens, which is a very important lens with respect to, uh, particularly our conversation about um, creating a, an inclusive POCD. So what that lens says is West Hartford will continue to respect the inherent value of each member of its community and each area in town by eliminating structural and institutional inequities that impede any sector of our community from reaching its full potential. Um, it, it took us a while to uh, collectively create the language around these lenses, but the lenses really helped focus our efforts on crafting the plan and the goals. Our vision statement, next slide. Um, as Francisco said, can be a broad statement or a paragraph, and it really needs to be kind of all-encompassing all of, of what the community strives to be. And, and in West Hartford's case, we strive to be a welcoming innovative, livable, and prosperous community with unique diversity across economic, religious, social, and cultural spectrums. We seek to maintain and promote our thriving community by providing equitable access to a variety of housing options, employment, transportation, education, and other amenities in a manner that reflects responsible stewardship of the environmental, social, cultural, 
and economic resources necessary for a vibrant quality of life for the town's current and future residents. Uh, this took countless hours of our planning commission's um, discussion and dialogue to craft this statement. And I think Francisco's highlighted uh, some of those, those key themes and some of the important both guiding lenses, but also um, the themes that a plan needs to cover. Specifically, although I don't have a slide for it here, I'd like to talk about our economic development goal because I think it's important and informative to the discussion for um, downtown resilience. And West Hartford's goal was to promote growth and retention of existing businesses and development of new business opportunities that strengthen the community's tax base in an innovative manner while preserving and protecting residential character of the surrounding neighborhoods. So clearly our goal uh, had an eye towards growth, but also balancing growth with, you know, you know potential impacts on, on surrounding areas. Um, to support that goal in West Hartford, you know, I think critical was the economic uh, retail analysis that, that we uh, ultimately engaged with Larissa Ortiz Associates in performing. And if, if we have time for questions later, um, that analysis was completed in the winter of 2019, our plan, I think, was ultimately adopted uh, in May of 2020, pre-COVID, and many of the strategies and recommendations that uh, were identified in the plan and, and thus pulled into our POCD actually uh, served us well through COVID, which was not on anyone's radar. So some of the actions and strategies in the plan apply directly um, in, in the COVID environment, and I think will we'll serve the community well. So with that, I'll, I'll stop my presentation, turn it back to Francisco. Yeah, uh, Todd, I, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about, before we move on to Bridgeport, the, uh, the, the guiding lenses. Uh, that, that's something I didn't you know, present earlier on. And uh, the idea of a lens is, is not always something we start out with. Uh, sometimes it is, sometimes there'll be some key uh, Themes, we often refer to these as themes as well, that are, are, are central to a plan or to what a community would like to achieve. And, and that very often is sustainability, right? People are very uh, aware of the need for sustainability. Um, and, and, it, and, it, and it is often equity as well. It, it's not always directly expressed in, in a plan or represented in the case of West Hartford. We, we did, uh, it, it, these did emerge as key themes or lenses. And so we decided to, to really highlight that in the plan. And, and so these lenses are exactly as they appear or as you would use a lens. Uh, you would use it to, uh, you know, really kind of pan over the document and everything that is consistent or supports that idea uh, would would really come to life would right you'd see it it would it pop out from the page and and so that's why we use the term lens and all these issues were really core to the plan and they they emerged through the planning process we didn't necessarily go in with these four uh, lenses and say let let's have the plan organized around these four lenses uh, some of these ideas were really important from the beginning, uh, equity and, and sustainability, but the importance of connectivity and innovation also came uh, forward throughout the process. So, you know, I would say as you're going through a process like this, uh, you know, remain open so that some of these really important themes and ideas can come forward. And, and by the time you go, you work through the process, get towards the end of it, uh, it they may be very apparent, in, in which case you can call some attention to them. And at, as Todd mentioned in West Hartford, we, we did a tremendous amount of outreach with really hundreds, if not thousands of people participating in, in some way. And I, I, I think the plan does a great job of, of capturing really the big ideas and concerns of, of most of the people that participated in, in that process. Uh, and, and Todd, I, you know, I don't, I, it's been a couple of years now, and I, I think it's actually, we got to go a year back. It was May of 2019 that I, I think you approved it. 
or, or some, it was definitely pre-pandemic. And uh, it, so it's been a point being, it's been a couple of years. It has, has this been a useful tool for you? And I suppose we can get more of this in the Q and A, but, but really quick, you know, give us a sense, like it, it's, has this been a useful tool for the community? Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that later on, uh, having seen the slide deck, I know you'll talk about the importance of uh, uh, implementation being worked into your plan. Yeah. But going into our process, I think one of the, the failures, if I want to call it that, of our prior plan was a lack of um, clear and direct implementation uh, guidance within the plan document itself. So we tried to structure this plan with its strategies, actions, and goals with an eye towards implementation to be used almost as a standalone checklist going forward that could serve as a foundation for future policies uh, and initiatives by you know, staff, our town council, our planning commission, other boards and commissions that have uh, different jurisdictional uh, aspects, also to serve as a guidance for future expenditures of, of capital funds in the community. Um, and, and with that in place, it, it, our, our POCD was adopted uh, right, I guess, just at the start of COVID last May, it was, it was essentially wrapped up last winter, but because of COVID, it was a delay in adopting it. Right, um, right. And then COVID has kind of slowed um, the process of um, some higher level uh, actions and initiatives, but we've already started tackling some initiatives that were outlined in the plan. I think, you know, uh, you know the, several of the ones that rise to the top of, of this process is uh, a focus on economic development initiative, initiatives, a focus on housing and promoting diverse housing options and choices. Uh, this past winter, uh, we adopted a uh, accessory dwelling unit ordinance that is an as of right type unit, um, very permissive, allowed in all of our residential zones with very limiting, very few limiting factors. Uh, and that was a direct uh, outgrowth and a recommendation in our plan of conservation development. So we're using it as that living document to help guide future policy initiatives. So uh, I'm excited that you know, uh, town leadership uh, is, is seeing it as that type of document that will serve the community towards uh, achieving its, its vision. Great, thank you, Todd. Okay, um, so Plan Bridgeport. Uh, plan Bridgeport is a plan we, we we're working with Bridgeport right around the same time as West Hartford. I think we started uh, uh, earlier than West Hartford. And, uh, you know, so here we have Connecticut's most populous city, uh, no shortage of uh, issues and challenges uh, to be tackled and uh, an incredibly am ambitious and visionary city planner and Lynn Haig uh, and, and her staff and, and uh, other departments that were extremely supportive of, of this effort. Uh, Bridgeport as a community was definitely all in. They, they, they put the resources and the commitment behind this planning process and front and center was uh, engaging the community in, in, in the process. Uh, the plan itself, uh, similar to West Hartford, there were some themes that emerged and that was uh, you know, planning for the waterfront transit-oriented development planning, housing, and neighborhoods. So those were four big themes, and, and we organized the plan around those themes. Uh, as I mentioned, if we go to the next slide, uh, we, we really wanted to plan with the community and, and not for the community. And, and that was a, a key phrase that, that we used in the process. And, and with that said, Zainab, you know, led much of our outreach, and I, I'd like to turn it over to her to talk about how we went about doing that. Thank you, Francisco. Um, yeah, so in Bridgeport, we had a short but quite powerful outreach campaign. So essentially over one summer in 2018, we had about nine pop-up events, 15 stakeholder meetings. Um, following that, we had about six thematic meetings which related back to the themes that um, we showed you earlier and a few other ones that really came out of our stakeholder meetings and our outreach events. And throughout that process, we were continually meeting with our project steering committee, which was a diverse and quite representative group of people from 
um, community groups, universities, different businesses, and um, various um, stakeholders throughout the city who could serve as a liaison and also an advice, an advisory committee throughout our outreach efforts and our visioning process. And they were a great um, tool and resource to lean on to really identify where our gaps were. Um, so repeating again, the planning with the community, not for the community, we were really going for um, the opposite of a prescriptive approach, which we know never really works with the diversity and uniqueness of each geography. We wanted to make sure that, first of all, we understood what the community was. So that came from identifying um, with, you know, demographic information, the steering committee, the city, um, various nonprofits and community groups, identifying all of the communities who exist and thrive in Bridgeport and what would be the best way to reach them and bring them into this process. So at first, I would say we were met with quite a bit of um, skepticism and resistance. It was, um, you guys are doing another plan, really, because Bridgeport in the past decade or so had been working on quite a, a few planning efforts. So it was a bit of um, rebuilding of trust that we are here to combine all of those previous efforts, work with everything that's been done and put in plan um, uh, um, some recommendations, some implementation strategies that will take Bridgeport over the next 10 years and beyond. So through that, we um, had all of these pop-up events where we really created a recognizable brand um, through, you could see on the last slide, there was our, their planned Bridgeport booth that was at pretty much every single community event that went on over that summer of 2018. So by the first time, you know, people were interested, they were saying, oh, what's this? And by the end of the summer, it was, oh, hey, you guys are the Planned Bridgeport people. And there was, a, I would say, a comfort and um, a trust that was built throughout this outreach campaign where we were trying to listen and write down and be as helpful as possible because we understood and the city backed us up that the outreach campaign is going to lead the POCD process. It, it will be something that is enriched through the voices and the diverse and unique culture of Bridgeport. And I think it was a, a ton of work to really get all of this um, outreach together and then synthesize it and create um, themes and lenses and um, really have an iterative process where at no point did we, as Francisco mentioned, with lenses, they weren't um, something that was predetermined. It was always something that was reevaluated based on every outreach event that we had. We would go back to our steering committee, we would go back to the city, and we would look at what are we hearing, who are we hearing it from, and are these the right people? And by the right people, I mean, is this a great and is this a good representation of Bridgeport's diversity? Or is this people we've heard from in previous years that isn't quite as um, representative of the population of Bridgeport? Um, yeah, so, and then I really wanna focus on, I guess, the neighborhoods and the, the four themes that we talked about with the um, TOD, um, waterfront and neighborhoods and open space. Those were really unique to Bridgeport and um, went a little bit beyond, I think, the, the standard, what we had talked about, what um, POCDs focus on. It was um, what we heard from our steering committee and everyone that we talked to at various outreach events was Bridgeport has a very unique neighborhood culture. There is a lot of history with the parks and the waterfront. Um, Bridgeport has the ability to be more than the municipality. We can plan for it to be a regional center, which it is, and it needs to really shift into that. Um, so we focus beyond, you know, what we were looking at that were coming out and we looked at what makes Bridgeport unique and how can we hear everything that we've heard and put it into a plan. 
that will go for the next 10 years. Yeah, and, and to, to reinforce Sanab's point there, it, there, there, was, there has been a tremendous amount of planning work done in Bridgeport. And I think one of, one of our challenges and what we did with the plan itself, Plan Bridgeport, was really to filter through all of those ideas that it, in some ways seemed like they were going in all different directions and, then, and, and bring them all together, thread them all together into this plan. And, and help people understand all of those moving parts and how they can all fit together. And, and because, you know, Bridgeport is kind of hypersensitive about accountability and transparency because of issues in the past and governance. And, and the planning department wanted to ensure that this process was as transparent and as accountable as possible. So if you go to our the planbridgeport.com website, there's a link to the implementation summary. And that Im implementation summary or plan has all of the plans, goals, recommendations, you know, strategies, action items. You can search through all of them. And we have progress bars that we we provided that the city can update uh, to show that they are making progress on some of these commitments. Um, and, and that was our way of bringing all of that energy, all the planning and ideas together into one place that makes a, a real commitment uh, towards realizing uh, the, the various visions in Bridgeport. Um, so I, I'd like to transition now to our third community and that being Danbury. And Danbury fits somewhere exactly in between West Hartford and Bridgeport. It, it, it demographically, socioeconomically, it, it's really interesting. It, it's right, it's, it's a city, but a small city. Uh, it's, uh, you know, bigger than West Hartford, but yet it is, it's development uh, followed uh, West Hartford's in terms of historical development with a tremendous amount of development following uh, World War II yet a, a more historic town center or city center in this case. Uh, so Danbury it, is really interesting community. It uh, historically is a very diverse community. Um, and uh, it, it, you know, it has its origins like many uh, cities or towns of Connecticut with a, a industrial base. Um, but it, it's an interesting community in that it's grown consistently, very consistently, and has never experienced population loss. And that's something that they're very uh, proud of. Um, at Danbury, we are very, very early in the process. We started work uh, a few months ago. And, and so we, we uh, really haven't hit the ground running with our community engagement, although we've been preparing for this for a while. And I think this plan is in, in this process is probably similar to many in the in the our current COVID uh, era or period. Uh, in that we are trying to figure out the community engagement and how to make it effective and, and inclusive. And and because of that, we have been kind of delaying uh, as much as possible uh, getting out there to the community. Uh, so that we can get out there to the community. So what we're looking at now in Danbury, most likely is a September launch uh, of the community engagement uh, effort. Um, we have to date, because we've been at work uh, for a while now, and, and we, want, we also want this process to be transparent. We've established a website where people can go uh, get information about what this process and what the plan is all about. Uh, we have our, our meeting uh, presentations and summaries on there. And, and one of the things we did very early in the process is to develop a public engagement plan and do some branding. And if you'll notice, each one of these communities, there we have logos and some branding associated with those plans. In West Hartford, Todd actually designed the logo. Uh, he actually happens to be a pretty good graphic designer, as it turns out. 
Uh, and in Plant Bridgeport, we had some staff on that. And in Danbury, we, we brought Lumi Agency, their marketing firm, uh, on our team that they had built the city's website. And uh, we thought they would could be really helpful in developing, helping us to develop um, an image and communications for this. It, it, this is just, a, you know, a branding and a logo is just a handle that can make it easy for people to really grab onto the process and to hold on. It, it communicates something very quickly, very effectively, and it, and it helps with all of your materials, whether it's flyers or surveys, uh, email blast, uh, social media posts, and then the document itself. It, it helps orient people very quickly and it catches their eye. And it, you know, we don't want, we don't want it to be a gimmick the plan itself is, is not just about graphic design and imagery. What it is about is it's about representing something. And so these symbols all, we're, we're trying to represent something. I, I think you can see in Danbury's, it's both the shape of a leaf and it's also uh, some roads and an intersection and city blocks and it, it's colors which suggest different themes. Uh, and there's a tremendous amount of work that goes into arriving at, at one of these uh, uh, logos, but it's it's really important just for associating the process with an idea. And as I mentioned, we have a website that's online and, and we're easing into things. So if we go to the next slide, we'll, we'll talk about how we're easing into public engagement. First of all, we have an oversight committee. We meet with monthly and, and we're incrementally right now working through uh, you know, basic existing conditions, demographic stuff uh, to help people understand where Danbury is at today and, and what the trends are in the community. And we're starting to develop some online tools so that when we do uh, launch with the public in our public engagement effort in September, uh, we do want to do in-person uh, events and meetings, but we also want to provide an online platform for a couple of reasons. First, for people that are aren't comfortable or aren't in a position to join us in a public forum, in-person forum. And second, you know, it should, should, and God forbid, you know, should we have to rein things in again because of any issues with COVID. Uh, so we, we want to be prepared for that. And, and we, we, over the past year, have really developed a lot of expertise in trying to make engaging online tools such as interactive maps and surveys and, you know, Zoom meetings that are engaging and effective uh, and interesting for people to participate in. So uh, with that being said, I want to zoom out a little bit and bring it back to uh, people focused planning. And, and uh, I, I'm going to turn it back over to Zainab to talk about how we go about uh, making sure that people are the focus of all of our planning work. And, and Zainab, please, please go ahead. Yep, sure. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so zooming out and, you know, just talking about our guiding principles that we use for outreach, obviously we tailor each outreach strategy to the community and communities that we're working with. But for guiding principles, we want outreach that is inclusive, informative, and engaging. So we really don't want to be there checking a box saying, okay, we were there. We maybe talked to a couple people. We want to bring people in, inform them, and then keep them engaged so they want to be a part of the process for as long as it goes on. Um, so our second guiding principle is taking outreach to the people. So you can see in that first photo, we are at a community event in Bridgeport, the farmer's market. And so we have our branding set up, um, some games that look in enticing for kids and sometimes adults who doesn't want to spin a little wheel and answer some questions. We have some candy. So we want to bring people in, tell them what we're doing, show them that we're here to listen to them and then give them material to then go home and participate in a, in a survey or um, give their thoughts however they may please, because they can do it in either 30 seconds or if we've engaged them to the point that they want to continue, they can spend about 30 minutes writing out a letter and detailing all their thoughts. But you want to be able to give people every opportunity across multiple platforms and multiple, um, um, multiple 
time engagement efforts. So we also want events that are ADA accessible, family friendly, that welcome all participants because we never want to um, zero in our engagement efforts on one age group or one um, demo dem demography because the kids, seniors, um, so many people have great ideas about how they experience their city and what they would like to see improved in the future. Um, then we want multilingual materials um, and innovative tools and technology solutions to really maximize our participation from um, different communities, especially underrepresented populations. And next slide. So as I said before, engagement is an iterative process. We really want to analyze our responses frequently to ensure we are hearing from the diverse voices that exist in our communities. And then we want to use inclusive language in the visioning and engagement process that speaks to the unique culture and diversity of each neighborhood, town, or city. So when from the beginning, if you're using language that is colloquial or familiar or unique to a place, you've done your research with through outreach or through the steering committee or through even conversations with the city staff and you know what is unique and what is different about this place and you're trying to highlight that throughout each process of the engagement. And the next slide. So we use quite a few tools. So um, there's the project website where that is really a resource for all um, project materials, um, meeting, presentation slides, um, meeting summaries, photos, um, and also a link to all of these other tools, which would be a mapping tool where people can drop in um, little pins all over the city and talk about in a really specific way I like this, I do not like this, and this is why. And we really give people prompts at the bottom to say, um, you know, the parking here isn't great, or this place could use a little bit of public art or things like that. And we really rely on our social media, which we would create for the project, and then also utilizing existing social media channels. So if there's a community group in the in, in your municipality that's really strong, you want them to, re, to repost and work with your social media platform to amplify it so that word gets out to more people. Um, we did work, virtual workshops um, for people who can't attend or may not be able to attend um, thematic meetings or people we don't catch at a pop-up event. Um, we want people to have that opportunity to even go home after a pop-up event and tell their neighbors, hey, even if you didn't get to make it, there's a virtual workshop that you can participate in and give your thoughts and we would love to hear it. And then obviously online surveys, which we make available through the website, but then also bring with us to our pop-up events. And they're quite short and sweet, so people can kind of do them as they're passing by our booth. And it really makes it, I think, um, quite, local and then um, engaging because you're you're stopping people during their day and you're you're not um, asking for too much that they come to a three-hour meeting and sit down and even though that's part of the process it doesn't have to be the entire thing and I think that's what's really important yeah I believe that's about it oh Francisco back to you yeah, and I had mentioned earlier our implementation plan for Bridgeport. And uh, so here, I, I guess I got ahead of myself with this. <laughs> I forgot we had this slide. Um, but here it is. If, if, as I mentioned, if you go to planbridgeport.com, you'll, you'll see this. And, and so the example on the right is, uh, is a screenshot. And we have, uh, we built in a filtering tool so you can select different uh, themes and priority levels. You can filter it and search it by any means you like. And it has all of our goals and strategies. And you'll notice uh, progress bar there. They're 5% on their way to increase use of transit and alternative modes of transportation. So uh, good for them. And hopefully that bar has uh, moved a little uh, since then. Uh, once again, the whole point of this is to make the process uh, accessible to people, 
uh, transparent and accountable. And, and that's really for any community, not just for Bridgeport. And when you do that, you, you, uh, you, you make the process um, uh, for people and, and you make people part of the process uh, uh, rather than have uh, these internal machinations behind closed doors. Uh, you put it front and center and, and you, you allow everyone to get in there and, and figure it out. Uh, so with that said, that concludes uh, our presentation and I'll turn it back over to Kim. Great, thank you so much. Um, this is a chock full presentation as all of you um, attending know. I'm not sure if we have any questions that are in the chat box. Um, I know we have a couple of our people uh, uh, monitoring this um, and I know that we're coming up against the top of the hour. Um, so I don't know, Christine, do we have, do we have any questions from, from the audience? None at this time, Kim. Okay. Um, I will say, I know having gone through um, a POCD process, I live in West Hartford, so I participated as a resident um, there. I think one of my personal favorite engagement tools was the online mapping tool um, that Zainab showed a moment ago on um, this lower right-hand corner um, where you could sort of articulate your hopes and dreams for specific sites within a community, or if you wanted to complain, you could do that too. Um, but I thought that that was just a really brilliant, tangible way for people to participate in this process, even if they didn't care to attend in person a meeting. Um, it was really a chance to, I know for me personally, there were a couple of sites in town that I always wondered about and felt, oh, there has to be a higher and better use for what's happening in this particular site. So it, it was a way to sort of express um, that opinion and get that into the record. So I personally just really appreciate it that opportunity. I don't know if either Todd or Francisco or Zainab, you have some reflections on how that tool is being used within your experience? Our, our challenge, Kim, is always to, it, building the tool is, is you know, it, it's easy for the staff or our staff that know how to do that. <laughs> Uh, I, I have no idea how they make it work. And Eric Smith from our office is absolutely brilliant with this type of work. So the technical part of it, we've, we figured out pretty well. And these are mostly custom made applications. The real challenge is filtering all that information. That's where all of the work is, right? And, and making sure that we're not ignoring issues or, or individuals that all that information is represented somehow and trying to figure out what to do with it, where to put it. And that's where the real work is. Yeah, yeah, I can appreciate that. Kim, Kim I'd like to also comment, you know, this, this slide here, the online surveys, um, when you're trying to be inclusive and, and generate participation from the community, you know, we, we have to keep in mind and, and not everyone is comfortable in an online environment or using computers or has access to computers. So we took the same content of our online survey. We printed those out and we put those in all of our public libraries and our town hall and our community centers. And we had, you know, close to 75 people fill out the old fashioned paper survey. And then we had to then uh, manually input that data back in, into the online survey process. But, you know, that's an important consideration um, that you need to make and be aware of that not everyone uh, is still comfortable or has access to computers or online technology. Yeah, excellent point. Thank you, Todd. I'm going to jump ahead here because I know we are just past the hour and we have a CCM breakout discussion. So thank you once again, Francisco Gomes, Zainab Kazmi, Todd Dume for being on our panel today. Um, once again, for attendees, the recording of today's session will be available on our website within the next day or so. And it's um, on demand, so anybody can view this at any time. So do please feel free to share this. All of our workshop archives are also loaded, located at ctmainstreet.org. Um, so with that, thank you so much. Um, we are just about to break for our CCM members only group, um, but we'd like to give you all a three minute break 
Um, we know that we can use one on our end, on the technical end. So we'll see you back here in three minutes. Thank you.